Hello, my name is Michael Berg, and on behalf of the Time International Movement, I'd like to thank you for joining us. This video is part of our ongoing webinar series, which is Future Skills for Workplace Sustainability. And if you've missed any of our previous webinars, do not worry. You'll be able to catch up via subscribing to our Youth Time International Movement YouTube channel and heading to the playlist section. There you'll be able to find all of our previous webinars. This webinar is brought to you focusing on social innovation for systems change and sustainable development. And we're joined by our expert speakers, Viliana Nurishab from Reimagined Futures. So without further ado, let's begin. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks for having us, Mickey. Um, I just wanted to let you know we're grateful for the opportunity, and I think this is a, is a great time to be talking about social innovation and, and sustainable development and uh, systems change. I think we're on the cusp of a lot of things uh, globally. Um, we all are in the midst of a pandemic, and we know that, but I think there's a lot of other things um, that, that are happening that will speak to this topic and, and there's some major political changes happening. There's some major social uh, movements going across the world right now. And I think this is all um, adding up to what we're gonna talk about in the next couple of minutes. We can do a quick uh, introduction of Reimagine Futures. We are a collective of sustainability practitioners and systems change practitioners. Uh, and we really look into uh, helping individuals and organizations go deeper into the root causes of problems and uh, try to reach that goal of sustainable development that we'll talk to you more about this session. And, uh, thanks, Willy. Um, we have some big names and terms out there. And, and I think uh, what's important here when we begin is to provide um, some context. So uh, the reason why things like systems change are important and why we're seeing systems change take place uh, and why we're moving towards sustainable development using social innovation uh, is basically because the world we live in and the world um, we're experiencing currently, uh, the global socioeconomic system uh, is changing. As is, when you live through change, you don't necessarily feel that it's happening. Um, it's always easier to analyze as something that's happened in the past. But rest assured, change is happening uh, and we're living through it. And essentially, we're in a period uh, of paradigm shift. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of lingo, but, it, but there's no other way to put this. We are basically moving from a system or a bunch of systems and, and an older uh, paradigm, which we're in currently, uh, into a new one. And of course, this doesn't happen in one go. We don't overnight have, have revolution and movement and change. Uh, these processes of change are slow, incremental, and take place um, as different systems within the older systems uh, get replaced by newer ones. Um, so just very quickly, let's try and understand uh, what is the current system we're in, what is the current paradigm we're in, uh, and where are we then heading to, and why are we heading to this new paradigm? Um, broadly, if we had to summarize what the world looks like right now, what the world's socioeconomic system looks like right now, uh, we'd say it's a combination of inefficient, mostly inefficient, um, state-led interventions or state-led planning uh, in the sense that, yes, they have no aspirations, but they're not particularly well done, uh, with the combination of transnational profit maximization-based capitalism, where you have the big corporates out there who are very only, who are only interested in, 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 in profit maximization and shareholder value maximization. Uh, and this leads to a situation which is essentially untenable, what we have today, which is unsustainable development. Uh, where we are developing and growing at odds with everything around us. So at odds with the planet, at odds with our social structures, at odds with the ecosystem and with nature. Uh, and essentially in this process, what's happening is that other stakeholders are being left out or don't actually have much of a say. Uh, and some of the other stakeholders that are being left out of this conversation 
uh, include collective organizations like farmers and sort of people working in rural areas, um, civil society uh, in general. And in a lot of cases, the you know, individuals, individual entrepreneurs who don't actually have their say in the way the system is structured. Now, there's a couple of images there and I actually wanna to speak to them to give you examples of what I mean. So uh, I, I trust that some of you are familiar with this, but Berlin's Brandenburg Airport opened uh, late last month or at the end of October. Uh, and this is a great example of an inefficient state-led intervention. Uh, the airport was initially planned to be opened in 2011 and it took them nine years. And this is very unlike the Germans and the German efficiency and the, and the ability to deliver on time. It took them nine years more than they expected to to, to, to create the airport, but more alarmingly was the budget of the airport was 2.8 billion euros and then eventually ended up costing or will end up costing uh, over 11 billion euros. So there's a huge problem there. And there's a number of issues because apparently the airport was planned for Berlin to become a hub uh, for flights. And then they realized that the other hubs in Germany, which were Frankfurt and Munich were not going to give up their position. And Air Berlin, which was supposed to be the major airline to use Berlin as a hub shut down. Uh, so the whole airport design had to be restructured. Um, and this is essentially an example of, of what's, you know, what's currently happening where you have states and, and sort of state led uh, or public entities trying to, to foster growth, but not doing a very efficient job of it. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, we have everyone's favorite enemy, big tech. Uh, and the classic example of this is, is Facebook and the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. You all know about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Uh, they essentially created an app that stole people's data, uh, and this was done eventually to the political marketing purposes. Um, we had a film come out of it, The Social Dilemma, if you haven't seen that, but essentially this basically illustrates the values that are inherently within today's uh, techno-capitalistic co corporations, where the goal is to make profit and make money at all odds. Uh, and that includes in some ways conducting legal activities, but also without taking into consideration the needs of the other stakeholders. So people who use Facebook, the shareholders, the values trumped the users needs on Facebook. Uh, and this leads to a situation where you have unsustainable development because essentially profit is at the heart of everything. Uh, and the example there of unsustainable development I have is supposed to be an image of the Deepwater Horizon um, oil rig, which exploded in the US in 2010. Uh, this was a British petroleum rig off the coast of Louisiana, leading to the world's largest oil spill uh, in coastal waters. And the reasons there, and there were systemic reasons of why this happened, but the major, majority of reasons were, uh, major reasons basically talked, uh, focused on the fact that the construction wasn't done to good quality, um, there was a focus on saving money to and reducing costs and essentially you ended up with uh, a system that was not viable and led to this massive oil spill. So that's basically uh, what the old paradigm looks like. You have state-led interventions, you have transnational corporates who do not value anything but shareholder profit maximization and you have a situation where you have unsustainable development and as we know uh, this cannot continue. This global pandemic is a, a prime example of what happens when we sort of cross the barriers uh, with nature. Billy, can we go to the next slide, please? So what exactly is happening? So if those were the sort of the big players in the structure of the, of the, of the current paradigm, what is this resulting? What is the impact on the ground? Why does this affect us so much? So the first thing that's happening and the most, probably the most important thing that's happening, and especially being accentuated by the pandemic is the fact that you have rising inequalities and states are failing at their basic jobs. So basically that's a picture from my hometown in Bombay. As you can see, you see towers where the, you know, where the multimillionaires live in and just around that you have slums. Uh, and the pandemic has only accentuated the situation. Uh, you now have Jeff Bezos with an obscene amount of money, uh, partly because Amazon is delivering everything in the pandemic and you have people who've lost jobs, who've lost careers and don't have enough money uh, to put food on their table. And this is the job of the state, this is the job of the government to ensure that this kind of inequality does not exist and states are not able uh, to control this. And this is just happening all over the world. So the other thing that's also happening that accompanies this is that the institutions that exist currently um, at the corporate level, um, 
at the national levels as parts of states and organizations do not necessarily reflect the diversity of all the stakeholders. So what you're having is that these institutions, whether you know, to give you an example, whether the universities or organizations, essentially only represent the interests of certain stakeholders. Uh, and this is very, you know, directly connected to the fact that inequalities are rising. Uh, essentially what's happening is that they're re representing the interests of the rich uh, and those who have power. And what happens is that you have a situation where large groups of people go under and represented. Um, and as we've seen over the last couple of months and, and years, you have had uh, movements like Black Lives Matter and before that uh, Occupy Wall Street, which are basically trying to bring in uh, and show that people's needs need to be represented on the table wherever we go forward. So this is also a huge social issue, which is a result of the old paradigm and the old system. And finally, what this is resulting in is a destruction of our climate, of the climate and, and the ecosystem around us and destroying our relationship with nature. So human society is over, uh, over using nature, or abusing nature in some ways. Uh, and, and we're seeing the impact of that today. Uh, and this is, this is also a manifestation of the way the paradigm is currently structured, but also as a result of the other two things happening, where we feel that nature can keep providing and we can keep growing uh, off the ecosystem uh, and off the planet. And, and, and this is all being done to create more shareholder value and more profit. So it's, it's all cyclical, it's all connected. And this is unfortunately the reality of where we're at. Um, it is a slightly negative picture, but that's not actually the goal today. The goal is to say that we've actually begun this transition to move on to a more positive uh, framework, a more responsible framework. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Viliana to talk a little bit more about where we are today and how things are looking. Yeah, thank you, Rishabh. Well, I think what you described uh, just now is a bit of the doom and gloom um, of the current reality in many, many, many places, unfortunately. But as we've uh, seen, even in the recently published book, The Future We Choose, it is indeed about choices and it's about choices um, of a series of conscious decisions that we still can make as governments and societies uh, and really re reinvent that paradigm and, and create a new one almost um, and in that new paradigm what we are seeing is starting to emerge it's not fully there everywhere yet but it is starting to emerge um, um, we are seeing efficient state interventions uh, the opposite of what Rishab described we're actually seeing some some uh, states that are looking at root causes of, of wicked issues such as homelessness and unemployment and inequality etc and are trying to create efficient and meaningful interventions an example of that would be the universal basic income some of you might have heard of it maybe some of your countries have experimented with it already it's basically what it says it's um, it's a basic income that is uh, given to everyone unconditionally for an unlimited amount of time in its full version. And so far, we haven't really seen a full version experiment of it. But in Finland, um, they did a two year experiment with 2000 2, people that they randomly selected. Uh, all of them were uh, firstly unemployed. The actual, you know, the ideal scenario is everyone, no, no, no matter unemployed or employed. But in this experiment, they were all unemployed over two years and each of them received 560 euros per month. And the results were pretty telling. Uh, the, those, most people found jobs much faster than usually they would find if they were on state benefits. They felt the increase in their well-being and confidence. They felt treated with a lot more respect. Uh, they found jobs that are not just any jobs. They found meaningful jobs, both for themselves and for the community, things like art, um, social support, etc. And um, universal uh, basic income is actually a term that is um, very often used now, especially with the coronavirus crisis and, uh, and governments trying to cope with the uh, increasing um, loss of jobs because of the crisis but also because of the technological advancement um, it could be a very um, 
attainable solution very, very soon for many, uh, for many countries. The second element that we want to introduce today to this um, new paradigm is responsible capitalism. And that's when basically companies are actively taking part in regeneration uh, of natural resources or societal capital. Then they are proactively contributing. And of course, they are not um, destroy, destroying natural resources or evading tax, um, et cetera, et cetera. An example that I've given you here is Patagonia. You might be familiar with it. It's probably the most well-known example of a good company. Uh, it's a US uh, clothing company um, based, actually named after the, uh, the ecological region Patagonia in South Africa. And it's, um, yeah, it's exemplary in the way it works with its supply chain. It's um, really sustainable across every element of the supply chain, ensuring not only um, sustainable water usage for the uh, raw material production, um, fair treatment of the workers, fair pay, etc. But they also, even recently during uh, the Trump administration, when he managed to cut the tax for, for corporations. Actually, Patagonia paid those savings that they made from the tax they uh, reinvested in uh, ecological projects. Um, I'm uh, hopeful that we're seeing more and more of this responsible capitalism uh, around the world with the B Corp movement. We see more than 3,000 companies actually now signed up to, to be serving bigger goals than, than just their profit. Uh, so I think we're we're really feeling optimistic about the role of companies in regenerating our world. And finally, the third component that we want to present to you today is social innovation. I will go a little bit um, deeper in it in a second, but maybe here on the picture, I will explain that picture with, with an example that stuck with me uh, during my working um, time at Ashoka. I wanted to share with you uh, an example of David Green and Ashoka Fellow, a social entrepreneur and a social innovator, uh, who really spotted a gap in the market that both governments are and corporations weren't filling. And it, it was to do with the healthcare system, especially for more um, disadvantaged uh, citizens, especially in um, developing countries. So what David Green saw is a need to um, to provide more uh, affordable eye care service to um, people in developing countries. In particular, he started in India. He noticed that uh, cataract cases are extremely high and actually they cause up to 66% of, uh, of the blindness cases uh, in India at the time. And it's really sad because cataract is a completely treatable um, condition. It's actually very easily treated. It just needs a small surgery and um, an eye lens. Unfortunately, both of these were completely unaffordable for most of the population. So what he did is he managed to manufacture a lens that was 10 to 15 times cheaper than, uh, than the market average. And then he also partnered with the Aravind eye hospitals in India who on their own actually reinvented another concept, the concept of the operating room, the surgery room. So instead of having one surgery at a time in one room, they created a bit of a production line uh, where they have 10 beds and a few surgeons and a lot of medical staff at the same time, where each surgeon specializes in, in very few um, parts of the process of the, of the surgery and then moves on to the next. That way in one hour now, the Aravin hospital is able to operate on 10 people rather than on one people, increasing their capacity tenfold. So Aravin together with David Green's lens um, were a very effective social innovation that now serves a gap um, which was not addressed by government or private corporations. Um, so these three elements together, efficient state interventions, responsible capitalism and social innovation uh, are very important ingredients to make up for sustainable development. 
sustainable development is often summed up by the 17 sustainable development goals by the UN, the uh, SDGs. Um, and how we usually define sustainable development is, is development that meets the needs of the current generation uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs as well. And I uh, chose these two graphics to explain a little bit um, the different perspectives that we have on sustainable development from the old paradigm, paradigm compared to what we see in the new paradigm. So to the left, you will see uh, three bubbles, people, profit, planet, interacting with each other a little bit towards uh, the middle. This is uh, referred to as the triple bottom line. And this is how the old paradigm often saw sustainable development. Um, it's basically you do your business and you do a bit of good for the, for the society and a little bit of good for the planet and you're okay. And you can grow exponentially in profit as well. However, what we see in the new paradigm is that the relationship is slightly different. It is actually a nested system where the economy is nested within the boundaries of society and society and the economy are then nested within the boundaries of environment. Therefore, there are very, some very clear boundaries and exponential growth is not, is not an option. Like the usual idea that we have of GDP and every country needing to report growth every year economically, that's not actually a viable option for sustainable development. And we can talk a lot more about GDP and, uh, <laughs> and that um, in another webinar probably. I wanted to also quickly give you an idea of how we see social innovation and the social innovation curve, especially for systems change. So how it usually starts is with prompts of needs, of needs and problems, but not just needs and problems, but the root causes of that need and that problem. It's, it's very important. If we're going to aim for that 0 0.6, the systemic change, we need to be looking at the root causes. So a social innovator would identify the root causes of a problem. Then they will go into the second stage, which is about proposals. And by proposals, we mean ideation and brainstorming sessions and a lot of, um, a lot of post-its, a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of suggestions of, of possible solutions. That would be usually a really fun um, series of activities, uh, ideation sessions. It would be, um, yeah, it would be a lot of creativity flowing. But from those ideas, we need to choose um, a few to then prototype. Prototype is basically developing ideas, further trialing, testing, and uh, impact measuring. So impact measurement is a very key element of prototypes. Those prototypes that are the most impactful and sustainable will then go into a stage into the uh, sustaining and scaling stage, which is about um, really making sure that um, those impact solutions uh, ta targeting leverage points in the system, the points where a small effort or limited resource can actually get you a long way into making systemic change. So that is briefly the social innovation process uh, leading to systemic change. And on this slide, I've uh, indicated two tools that can help us develop a skill, which we call systems thinking skill, which is what we need in order to be social innovators, in order to be impactful social innovators, I would say. The, there's a lot of science behind these tools. I'm gonna just very briefly cover them. On the left, you see the iceberg model. And the iceberg model, like a typical iceberg, shows you to go deeper and see under the surface. Um, Oh, over, the, over the water, we usually see just the top of the iceberg, the 20% of the iceberg. And this is uh, what, what, what is visible to everyone, what we hear, what we see. These are the usually events. So just to give you an example, for this case, we can uh, take the, the event of me catching a cold this season. I got a cold. But then if we go deeper and we look at the patterns and uh, trends that are behind that, occur that event, uh, and that are also have been happening over time, we can see that I have been catching more colds when I'm sleeping less usually. And that's a pattern. Then if we go even deeper and we ask ourselves, what are the underlying structures uh, that are influencing those patterns? And what are the relationships between the different elements? 
And then we'll see that actually I've been experiencing more stress at work. I've been uh, not eating well. I've had difficult accessing healthy foods near my home or what my work. These are structures that have been um, kind of hidden behind the patterns and the events of my behavior. And then digging even deeper at the very bottom, at the dark waters of that um, iceberg, we see that this is, this is about mental models. This is about how I see the world. And, that, and I don't even realize I do that because it is so deeply engraved in my consciousness that I don't realize it. So these are my assumptions, my beliefs, my values that I hold about the system. Um, for example, I believe that career is the most important part of our identity. I believe that healthy food is too expensive. And I also believe that rest is for the unmotivated. By the way, for the record, this is not actually me. I don't believe in that. Um, but th these are the mental models that are really bounding everything that I do. And then they're leading to those structures that I have created in my life and those patterns that are repeating over and over again. And then actually they led me to having that call the other day. So that's the iceberg model. And it is very useful to help us think in systems. And now uh, to the right, we have an example of a systems map, well, which we've developed through Reimagined Futures. It is quite complex. There is no need to go deep into it, but it is about the food system and it really is analyzing the relationships between the different problems uh, and the different elements within the food system, how food waste is connected to food production, but also transportation and packaging and advertising and processing, etc. And that whole thing really helps us to understand the bigger picture and the interrelatedness between that, between um, the different elements of the system. And now I will show you a fun video uh, that will actually illustrate something that's not so fun. It really shows how without systems thinking, we can end up um, spending a lot of money, a lot of time, and actually causing a lot more problems um, when we are trying to, say, to solve them, in fact. So I hope you hear the sound of this next video and I hope you enjoy it. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria. So they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects though, the first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around eight years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation.
Thanks, Philly, really, for uh, being a little more positive and explaining all the different uh, ways that we've, we're getting into the new paradigm. And I think uh, what's important here is to sort of state that we, we, we genuinely believe we're in um, the first steps and in certain cases beyond the first steps into the new paradigm. And I think uh, we're seeing a lot of um, this being resonated with the people we're working with, the companies we're talking to. And I think it, this is all now on the minds of, of a lot of people. Uh, and if anything, while you know COVID might be the dying breath, the sort of shot of adrenaline um, for the old paradigm right now, uh, and we're still seeing, you know, the last bits of the of the of the old paradigm with you know the del Amazon deliveries going up and people trying to create more gas fields and oil fields, uh, it it doesn't seem particularly uh, a long term sustainable strategy. So you you will um, see governments um, particularly. Uh, in Europe initially, uh, pumping in a lot of money into, into new ideas and new uh, methods of going forward. And I think a lot of this is going to be premised on moving towards sustainable development. Uh, we have the EU uh, New Green Deal, which is happening now and will happen, and there's a lot of funding coming forward through that. But also, uh, you know, premising other um, ways and other methods of and approaches of going forward. Uh, and one of these is, is sort of the idea that social innovation is now all pervasive. Uh, social entrepreneurs are going to take on a lot of the burden as they go forward, uh, taking away and filling some of the gaps that existing uh, corporations and companies cannot do, but also that states so far have been unable to do because states are too large and not nimble enough to deal with local uh, concerns. So. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the mindset, so the sort of approach uh, that social entrepreneurs and social innovation uh, are taking as, as we go forward in the next couple uh, of decades. I think it's important to understand here that, uh, yes, social innovation is happening, but it's not only happening with social entrepreneurs. We have now social innovation happening across the board. So we have uh, governments, government institutions government departments trying to harness the power of social innovation and innovation mindsets, but also corporates who are trying to do the same thing uh, as they themselves realize that they need to uh, come up with new ways of, of, of working on things. So uh, the, the difference a social innovation mindset you know, has in terms of the way it operates and what its goals are from the current sort of shareholder maximization profit maximization structure is that at the heart of this is, is social capital and, and well-being and the fact that we're focusing on the social first, we're focusing on humans first, we're focusing on human needs first, and we're putting uh, the money aspect in some ways second. So it's no longer so much about the economic, it's about making sure that those we work with, those we support, the reason why we, we, you know, why we create business, the reason why we create products is to improve the quality of lives uh, with, of people. Uh, and this, of course, in uh you know in collaboration with nature rather than doing it against nature like we've seen uh in the past so essentially social innovation is human centered in all in all possible ways and i'm not and i do not mean anthropogenic i'm saying human centered because i think the idea is that it's human centered and we're trying to improve the quality of lives of people uh, it is at its best a participatory method that uses collective intelligence. And when I say participatory, I mean that everyone's involved in the process. Uh, and, and the best example of this is uh, Wikipedia, okay, collective intelligence. The fact that um, we are looking for more verifiable sources of information. We know Wikipedia has its faults. We don't trust the media sometimes these days. We don't trust social media. But then we have Wikipedia that shows up as a collective form of intelligence and it also demonstrates the next two points i want to talk about which are collaboration uh, and co-creation as the mantras rather than competition because in the past it's always been about competition whoever comes first gets the most money but the idea that we can collaborate across sectors uh, and not create silos and also co-create um, together and i think this is something that you know something we're doing a lot in the in the sector that i'm working in right now i work with refugees in cyprus uh, and the whole idea as we go forward now is, is about co-creation and giving people agency, uh, hearing their voices, um, allowing them to shape the decisions that are made uh, for them, 
And one, one particular example of this is the idea and the use of social labs. Um, social labs are a revolutionary new participatory process which you allow different stakeholders to come together and allow for the creation of new policies using their opinions and inputs. Uh, and this is also being reflected now in the structures and it's having some knock-on effect uh, in, in, in the corporate companies and, and organizations uh, as they themselves are moving away from these sort of hierarchical, siloed, uh, power-driven uh, structures to structures that are more open and fair and uh, reflective of different stakeholders that are reflective of different gender concerns, uh, moving away from one person to many, moving away from roles to task-driven processes, uh, and moving away essentially to what is being known as a holacracy. Uh, and this, as I mentioned earlier, is premised on the idea that we, we want to maximize human well-being. We don't necessarily want to maximize profit so much anymore and value, and we're trying to build social capital. We're trying to create an alternative sense of value, and value is not necessarily always uh, economic. Can we just go to the next slide, Billy, please? Um, and the next question that arises then is, how is this happening? This is, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not that companies wake up one day and say, okay, we're now moving into a non-hierarchical organization that's focused on making everyone's lives better. You don't, you don't do that overnight. It's, 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 it's a process that's a process in some ways of, of creative destruction. It's a process of collaboration. It's a process of brainstorming. Um, it's a process of prototyping. It's a process of learning by doing. Uh, and it's a process of being comfortable uh, with failure. These are all different elements of social innovation. Uh, and what we work with, or the different tools or aspects that we've worked with so far, uh, include uh, hackathons and boot camps. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with this. The idea that you can you know, work together online, bring in different groups to focus on a certain uh, project, and then uh, you know, put them in a room. We can't get in rooms anymore because of COVID, so we get into long Zoom calls instead. Uh, and we try and understand problems and then we brainstorm and come up with ideas and then these ideas uh, you know get selected and move for the next stage then we get help from mentors and then they come out as as finalized products after a few stages uh, of prototyping the same things also happen within organizations these days uh, organizations are looking at entrepreneurs and they run innovation labs within companies uh, this is all being done with the support of design sprints uh, I talked a little bit earlier about social labs and open spaces. Uh, these are now not so much being used in, in, in corporate structures, but more in governmental structures or in social structures, socio-political structures, uh, where we have different ways of including participatory methods in the design of, uh, of urban and social uh, you know, structures and, 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 and policies and, and uh, rules that affect people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So a great example here is um, you see more and more, uh, especially this is happening in Scandinavia, you have, you have uh, municipalities who are creating uh, you know, open spaces, consultative open spaces for their citizens to come in and talk about their problems, uh, you know, agora, these kinds of uh, public fora, uh, and then these lead to collective phases of brainstorming of how to create solutions and then they're gone out and prototyped uh, and then you have a, a, this, the entire sort of rulemaking and governmental lawmaking process then becomes a, you know moves away from being a top-down process to being a process where it's co-created bottom up with, with citizens i hope that kind of uh, provides a short explanation of how uh, we've, we've, we, you know, how we experience and how we see the new paradigm being structured. Um, and I guess we are open to questions. Really, do you want something to add? No, that's uh, that's basically it. A lot of a lot of stuff combined in forty minutes. Uh, I hope we haven't confused you too much. We did uh, throw some big words like paradigms and uh, systems change and. It's, it's all very complicated at the same time it's also also very all very natural and i think that's the thing that we we're kind of understanding more and more uh, as we work in this field is that we've moved away from our natural thinking capacities and we've gone into very uh, processed way of thinking and 
I guess our call and our invitation is to go back to that systems thinking and seeing the interconnectedness of everything. So uh, thank, thank you both for that very informative um, description of what's going on. I think it's probably the most relevant topic of our time at the moment, and it's something which um, more and more people are becoming more aware of, but don't necessarily know where to start with this information. So um, I'm really thankful for both of you being here to kind of give this um, basis and this start for them for other people to start thinking about this kind of uh, systemic change and how we tackle it. Um, we do have a few questions uh, coming through. So um, let's go to uh, Rishab first. Um, so back to your um, first example with Berlin Airport. So they were looking to do their development, but they seem to fail in a manner where it cost them a lot more because they weren't bringing other people along the way. So with that, um, a lot of people say it's better to do something than nothing. So when it comes to social impact, but is it? Because obviously it cost them a lot more by not getting other people to follow them. Thank you, I'm sorry, I have terrible, uh, I seem to have lost my internet connection. You might have to repeat that. <laughs> That's fine, that's fine, not a problem. <laughs> As we mentioned with technical stuff, when you're going live, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, so just repeating that question, so it's back to your original example with Berlin Airport. So they obviously wanted to do their development, but because they didn't bring other hubs with them to follow, it ended up costing them a lot more, which affects their future for sustainability. So with that, a lot of people say it's better to do something than nothing when it comes to social impact, but is it really? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with the, maybe really you want to take that? I can't, I yeah. can't, I'm not getting the connect the question. No, no problem. I can take it. Um, a bad Zoom is overwhelmed now. Um, yeah, well, is it better to do something than nothing? <laughs> to be, I don't want to be controversial, but I would say it's better to do nothing. Uh, as we saw with the video in Borneo and how, how, um, unintended consequences can really cause more serious problems uh, and many more of them as well. Uh, I think the most important thing that, that all of us should do is we should try to live as sustainably as possible, uh, including our daily, you know, just normal daily life sustainability. And then when it comes to engaging in a social impact project or, or working on a project, I think it is better to slow down, to, to really use some of those systems thinking tools to look at the system and how any action can, can trigger many multiple reactions um, than quickly rushing into, an, into doing something. Um, I would say, yeah, better slow down and maybe do nothing for a bit while you're thinking and you're really like understanding the system. Perfect, perfect. So really you start off with the recycling, things like that. Everyone has the power to do that. But if you want to go further for a massive social impact, it's getting people on board really with you so you can have that uh, mindset to everyone having those opinions and seeing what that end result could be before you jump ahead. Mm -hmm. And there's much more than just recycling, by the way. You can, uh, you can have a huge contribution to sustainability purely with your everyday actions, whether this is recycling, whether this is the way you shop, whether this is your diet, the way you travel, the way you use water, the way you brush your teeth, you know, everything yeah. is important. That's like the uh, movement of hashtag uh, vegan Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> Same sort of principle as that. Oh, um, how many more hashtags I can create? Before? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're running out of time, but we'll just go for one, one last question really, which is, um, I suppose a little controversial. Um, so currently with a lot of uh, social innovations, a lot of them, they come from the people. So we're trying to ta uh, tackle systemic racism through the Black Lives Movement um, going on. Um, and it seems that uh, governments, they're trying to tackle the symptoms, not really doing too much of the actual movement of the cause behind it. So do you think that governments have any systems thinking skills? Uh... Yeah, I think this is something that's that's coming, um, coming. You know, I think governments have systems thinking skills. I think the bureaucrats who actually work on policy policy do, and I actually think they come up with solutions that actually go after the root causes. But the question is, do the politicians who actually have to implement the policies have the political guts to do it? I think that's that's the bigger problem. 
So I think governments have the skills. I think politicians uh, today, for, for a lot of these major issues, are too scared to speak their minds. Um, you know, wh whatever we're thinking of. I mean, let's. I mean, let's look at some of. Uh, you know, if move away from the controversial political issues in Europe in terms of. Uh, migration or race or things, but something very simple like coal. Okay, coal is a, we know coal is a problem. We know coal is destroying the planet, right? Uh, but we also know that even within the EU, uh, there are com countries that produce coal, and it's not so much within the EU the burning of the coal, but the fact that there's a large part of Poland's economy, a large part of you know of some certain German states of the Czech Republic, of Slovakia, of Eastern Europe. A lot of these countries' economies are dependent on coal, right? So what, well, the issue is not so much about the pollution and the burning of the coal, but the fact is, if, if this was being done system systemically, you'd stop creating coal. Because in the future, we know coal is not sustainable, it destroys the environment, and if you want to go after the root causes, you stop coal. But they're not going to do it because it's not so much about the pollution, it's about saying, okay, telling hundreds and thousands of people, you've lost your jobs. We don't have alternatives for you uh, for, for an entire region. You know, there are regions of Poland where this is the largest source of economy of economic uh, value. So these are the sort of political um, guts that politicians need and, and sometimes don't take. And, and this is my point. So that was, I think, so, so I, and, and I'm sure Vili has, had to, has had more to add. Yeah, and I also just think there is uh, very little structure for systems thinking. Uh, systems thinking requires a very long-term approach and really true multi-stakeholder collaboration and multi-party collaboration. And I'm not sure our political systems are structured uh, for that. I don't know if they, if it is even possible within the current structures that they have. So it really will need a lot of reinvention. Do you have any um, idea or any tools or just a general opinion on how they can kind of start kind of tackling that? Because from my from my side, in my opinion, a lot of countries mostly have people in um, in power uh, after an election for only a few years. So. How are they going to put something to tackle systemic issues if they're only in power for a few years and they're looking at trying to get the best they can create for their country over that period of time, which is generally only tackling those symptoms? Mm. It's difficult, eh? Yeah, well, I, I know. <laughs> the big, big issue for the whole world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, for example, the UK has um, a systems thinking unit. So these are uh, civil servants that permanently work. In, the, in that unit, so they don't change with government. That, that is uh, one solution, but not enough, obviously. And you also have, uh, you, you know, the Scandinavian example, and there's a couple, there's Oland in, in the north with the Finnish-Swedish border. You do have these sort of long-term multi-stakeholder processes between communities and their elected representatives that go beyond uh, just one political cycle and go across multiple cycles. So there's this constant, uh, constant multi-stakeholder engagement that goes on where they're able to inform their politicians what they want and they can at least at the local level or the very, very sort of municipal level deal with issues in a more systemic manner. Now the question really is, can we scale this beyond local and municipal to national or sort of regional? And I think the bigger question is, can we scale this beyond Scandinavia? Because Scandinavia mm -hmm. is always the, the positive example for everything. Yeah, another example that actually just uh, came to mind is um, Extinction Rebellion and the way they structure um, their call for systems changes. They, they, they bring together those assemblies of um, general assemblies of, of anyone from the public, like multi stakeholder, uh, together with government. Uh, so that, that is a good call for action. I guess that's on the on sustainability for now, but there is. I think there is a lot of potential in that kind of model around general assemblies. So at least we know there is something definitely there happening in the background, um, stuff around any communities as well. So there's always faith with everything and things will move to the, to the right direction we want. Well, they, I suppose they already are moving towards the right direction. We just want to make it faster. Um, and I suppose that's where organizations like ourselves and yourselves as well come in with NGOs, bridging that gap between the communities and their beliefs and giving them a bigger platform to hopefully be heard and change those opinions of the people in the higher seats, shall we say, to try and tackle those systemic problems. So thank you both uh, for joining us. Sally, we've run out of time, but thank you again for being a part of this. And like I say, I find it eye-opening and a great basis for people to kind of um, get behind with this uh, in information you provided to start thinking a slightly different way 
and making things a bit more aware because it is very, very relevant of our time at the moment. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Mickey, and thank you everyone at your time. I hope you find it useful. Thank you. Thank you for joining Youth Time International Movement with watching this webinar. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, which is Future Skills for Workplace Sustainability. And if you'd like to join any of our webinars on a live basis, then please just visit our Youth Time magazine, which is www.youth-time.eu and search webinars. There you'll be able to see the latest up and coming webinars and links to be able to register. Or you can visit our Facebook page and look at our events section. For all Youth Time latest news and up and coming activities, please just like, subscribe and follow on any of our social media platforms. Hope to see you again. Thank you.